morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to ACNS webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from India, Professor Prem S. Bhandari. Professor Bhandari is a senior consultant in plastic and reconstructive surgery at the Bridge Lal Super Specialty Hospital, Haldwani, Nainital, India. He is an active member of a number of professional associations such as Association of Plastic Surgeons of India, Indian Society for Surgery of the Hand, Indian Society of Peripheral Nerve Surgery and Brachial Plexus Surgery Group of India. He has been the past president of the Indian Society of Peripheral Nerve Surgery and Brachial Plexus Surgery Group of India. His major work has been researching and clinical practice in brachial plexus and peripheral nerve surgery. He is on the editorial board of numerous journals and is founder and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Peripheral Nerve Surgery. He has many publications in index journals and has contributed to several book chapters and he has been rewarded by the distinguished service of high order by the President of India. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today we will be talking about nerve transfers in traumatic brachial plexus injury, timing and surgical options. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Hu Peng. Professor Peng is a consultant in neurosurgery at the Suan Wu Hospital, Capital Medical University, Beijing, China. He is an accomplished skull base and cerebrovascular neurosurgeon who has several publications in this regard. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today we will be talking about epidural pretemporal transcavernous approach to intracranial vascular diseases. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Serbia, Professor Lukas Raslic. Professor Raslic is the head of Department of Peripheral Nerve Surgery and Functional Neurosurgeon and Pain Management at the University Clinical Center of Serbia. He was the president of the Serbian Neurosurgical Society, South East Europe Neurosurgical Society and the ENS Congress in 2022. He is the chairman of the Peripheral Nerve Surgery Committee of the WFNS and the vice president of European chapter of the Mediterranean Association of Neurosurgeons. He is a noted author with several publications in various periodic journals and is also the editor-in-chief of the Serbian Journal of Neurosurgery. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting an invitation to chair the first session of today's webinar. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honorable guest from Japan, Professor Naoki Otani. Professor Otani is a professor of neurosurgery at the Nihon University Graduate School of Medicine, Tokyo, <coughs> Japan. He is a proficient skull base and cerebrovascular surgeon and is an integral part of the ACNS delegation and is an invited faculty to several workshops and conferences. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Prof. Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Prof. Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair Professor Lukas Rastelic. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everybody uh, all over the world who is uh, watching this um, outstanding educational uh, initiative and uh, continuous uh, medical education via the webinars uh, organized by uh, Asian Congress of Neurosurgeons and it is my great uh, pleasure, honor, privilege and pleasure to uh, moderate this uh, session uh, on this webinar uh, devoted to the nerve transfer in traumatic brachial plexus injury timing and approach. My special regards and respects goes to Professor Yokato and uh, to our colleagues uh, from Asian Congress of Neurosurgical Societies. And um, now I would like to give a short uh, introduction. Uh, you heard the uh, all major. Uh, the facts about uh, Dr. Prem Bandari, who is will be our speaker today. Uh, I would like to add uh, that uh, he's a great friend, and uh, we know each other a long time ago. He's a, a supreme enthusiast in uh, brachial plexus and peripheral nerve surgery, so his experience is great, and uh, I'm sure that will be on a benefit for all participants of this uh, webinar. Uh, Professor Mandari will uh, give a talk about nerve transfers in traumatic brachial plexus injury timing and approaches, which is a very important um, issue in uh, brachial plexus surgery, since nerve transfers presents a viable option for restoring motor function after traumatic brachial plexus injuries. And uh, what is important uh, for uh, decision-making process in this situation is, uh, as uh, title of this presentation, uh, showed uh, timing and uh, also approaches for the nerve transfer, of course, technique, but most important is uh, 
uh, decision-making process in terms of uh, which type of nerve transfers should be provided to the patient in which situation, in which indication. And of course, uh, timing is uh, not an easy uh, task and easy, easy aspect of this story. So I'm sure that uh, I'm convinced that uh, you will enjoy this uh, outstanding presentation of uh, Dr. Prem Bandari. Thanks, Professor Lucas, for your nice introduction. I'll be basically talking on the not transfers in brachial plexus injury. The not transfers are indicated when there are nerve root avulsions, as manifested by the presence of pseudomeningoceles on MRI scan. Also, when there are scarred roots, which manifest as hyperintensive roots on MRI, these are considered to be non viable roots and they are not suitable for the nerve grafting. Uh, the commonly practiced nerve transfers are spinal accessory to suprascapular nerve transfer, long head rises branch to anti branch of X renal, ulnar and median of fascicles to biceps and brachialis branches, intercostal nerves to musculocutaneous nerve transfer, phrenic to musculocutaneous nerve transfer, brontocorditus branch of anti nerve to Extensor carpi release uh, brevis branch and contralateral C7 to median nerve. Now, these are the various transfer commonly performed transfers, and the choice of these nerve transfer will depend upon the type of injury, whether it's a partial injury, whether it's a lower plexal injury, whether it's a total brachial plexus injury or a infraclavicular injury. The most commonly done transfer in all types of injuries is spinal accessory to suprascapular nerve transfer. Traditionally, this uh, transfer is performed through a supraclavicular incision through which we dissect out the spinal excess in now along the anterior part of the trapezius and the suprascapular now which emerges on the lateral aspect of the upper trunk. So, these two nerves are close by and it is most of the time it is possible to do the nerve transfer without uh, any tension. But there are certain problems with uh, this anterior transfer between these two nerves. In severe grade brachial plexus injuries, it is not uncommon to find that uh, the suprascapular nerve has retracted and uh, it has retracted retroclavicularly or uh, even infraclavicularly. So, in such cases, if we do the uh, transfer between these two nerves, we either we have to put a nerve graft between the two nerves or we have to do uh, the, the anastomosis under tension. The another problem with the anterior transfer is that this transfer denervates few important branches to the trapezius. The upper part of trapezius has got important role to play in the stabilization and elevation of the shoulder. So, because of these reasons, I usually prefer to perform the uh, posterior transfer between the spinal accessory and the suprascapular nerve. The other advantage of this uh, posterior transfer is that it is uh, able to identify the distal injuries of the suprascapular nerve, which are more common with the fractures of the uh, clavicle, especially the widely displaced fractures, fractures of the scapula. So, in such cases, we expect that there could be a distal injury to the suprascapular nerve. So, we do the posterior transfer in such cases. Now, this is a patient who has been uh, uh, who has been explored anteriorly. We found that there was scarring in the supraclavicular nerve, suprascapular nerve. The suprascapular nerve was dissected right up to the suprascapular notch by the posterior approach. There are a lot of scar tissue which was covering the distal part of the suprascapular nerve. The fibrous tissue was removed and inside we found the healthy fascicles. So, this is the nerve very close to the suprascapular notch. Now, this nerve will be neurotized with the spinal accessory nerve. With posterior approach, it is possible to take a good length of spinal accessory nerve, which can easily reach to the distal most part of the suprascapular nerve. So, 
So in this case, we have done the poster transfer between these two nerves, and the transfer is without any 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 tension. So such kind of injuries we cannot manage by anterior transfer. The another advantage of posterior transfer is this is close to the target muscle, so it reduces the reinnervation time. What we found in cadaveric dissection is that if we measure the distance of suprascapular nerve from the upper trunk to the suprascapular nerve, it, it averages around 7.5 centimeter. By doing posterior transfer, which is about 2 to 2.5 centimeter proximal to the suprascapular notch, we reduce the reinnervation time considerably. So this is especially uh, indicated when the patients present late. Another indication for so the posterior transfer is that when there are extensive adhesions in the supra uh, clavicular region, for example, if the patient had a clavicular fracture and it has been stabilized with the plate, and uh, if you want to do the dissection in the same area to find out the target nerves, the spinal access in nerve, it becomes difficult. There is so much of fibrous tissue is there. So instead of going anteriorly, we can go posteriorly. So this transfer, it provides, it preserves the innervation to the upper eminal trapezius. It allows tension-free cooptation. The anastomotic site is unaffected by the neck movements. And the healthy donor and recipient nerves are in well-vascularized bed. And the reduction, uh, re this transfer reduces the reinnervation time and especially suitable for the patients who present late. But one major concern about the poster transfer is the suitability of distal spinal axis now, the, uh, the availability of the motor edge zones in the distal part of spinal axis now. So, for this reason, we performed the histomorphometric uh, analysis and we found that there are sufficient number of edge zones in the distal part of the spinal axis in now to motorize the suprascapular now. So, this is the, uh, I performed this transfer in semilateral position. The skin incision is over, just over this scapular spine. Through this, the part of the trapezius muscle is divided just above the scapular spine. And now we dissect out the spinal accessory now. We can take a good length, the run the now runs along the middle border of the scapula. Here is the suprascapular now in the yellow sling. So both the nerves are in close vicinity. The suprascapular now is divided proximally. And then we divide the distal part of the spinal accessory now. And then both the nerves are in, we get good length of both the target nerves. Now we can reduce the length of both the nerves so that we can reduce the reinnervation time by dividing their distal ends the extra fatty tissue is removed from the nose. This is the suprascapular now and spinal accessory now. So my preference for the suturing is that I use only one suture, one nano nylon suture, epineural suture. Uh, 
on micro point round body needle and the rest of the cooptation is done with the fibrin glue. So this is how the poster transfer is performed between these two nerves. The trapezius muscle can be sutured back with polygalactin sutures. And uh, then we close the skin incision. The, the other transfer which is very commonly used in partial injuries is the nerve transfer to the axillary nerve. And for this purpose, the long hair tricep branch is usually used as a donor now, as uh, described very well by Dr. Somsek Lika Wang and his uh, uh, team. And uh, this transfer is performed in the quadrangular space. My experience with Somsek transfer is that uh, sometimes there is difficulty in defining the plane between the long and lateral head of the triceps. And sometimes it becomes difficult to locate the axillary nerve in the tight quadrangular space. For this, uh, uh, to avoid or to avoid these problems, I prefer the terrace major approach. Terrace major is taken as a landmark. The long head tricep branch is just below the terrace major and the anterior branch of axillary nerve is just above the terrace major. So first we uh, find out the terrace major muscle, then we locate the recipient and donor nerves. So this is the incision which is uh, used for the terrace major approach. And uh, a back cut is made usually in the long head tricep branch and uh, uh, in the long head, in the terrace major, so that the long head tricep branch reaches without much of problem to the anterior branch of axillary nerve. The partial division of terrace major decreases strong adduction force. A relaxed quadrangular space allows a more proximal harvest of axillary nerve. And with a back cut in terrace major, it becomes possible to reach the takeoff point of long head tricep branch. So this is how the nerve transfer is performed. And this video will demonstrate how I perform this uh, uh, this uh, long head tricep branch to axillary transfer through the terrace major approach. These are the landmarks at the rank post axillary folds, and uh, they uh, are both joined with a curvilinear incision. And uh, this line, it demarcates the level of the lower border of the terrace major muscle. The vertical incision is made between the long and lateral head of triceps and along the posterior border of the deltoid. So through this incision, the first structure which we find out is the cutinous branch, which ultimately leads to the posterior branch of axillary nerve. This is the terrace major. The tenderness part of the terrace major is divided. Now, just inferior to that, we dissect out the long head tricep branch from the radial nerve. The advantage of this. Um, Approach is that there is no need to find out uh, or isolate the radial nerve. This is the end, uh, quadrangular space where the axillary nerve has been taped. Now we will have to find out the anterior and posterior branches of the axillary nerve. The anterior branch is divided proximally after stimulation, and long head tricep branch is divided is close to the muscle. The both the branches are in very close distance, uh, close very nearby, and they can be cooptate without much of tension. So this is a terrace major approach, a modification of Somsek approach. Advantages: it allows direct access to the long head tricep branch. It avoids unnecessary resection in the triangular space. The radial nerve is safeguarded, easier access to quadrangular space, and the operation time is reduced. The other nerve transfer which are used in partial injuries are the bifascicular nerve transfer, the ulnar and median nerve fascicle transfer to the biceps and the brachialis branches of musculocutaneous nerve. They have been very well described by Oberlin, McKinnon and 
other uh, workers. So very popular nerve transfer in partial injuries in restoration of elbow flexion. There are certain controversies in oval limb transfer. The first one is which fascicle should we use? When the article was first described by Oberlin, he insisted that we should use the branch which goes preferentially to the flexor carpi ulnaris. And for that uh, matter, later the articles mentioned that uh, uh, we should use FCR from the median nerve. And second controversy is whether we should do single or double nerve transfer. So this is the first uh, original article published in 1994 by the Dr. Oberlin, where FCU branch of the ulnar nerve in the arm was used for the biceps branch. But what I find I, I found on my uh, clinical assessment was that whichever branch you, whichever fascicle you stimulate in the arm region of the ulnar nerve we find that there is uh, ulnar flexion of the wrist and there is flexion of all the fingers. So this is a generally a mass action. So the, here we find the three fascicles in three different locations and which fascic which, whichever fascicle we stimulate, we find the similar kind of action. third fascicle. So, for, from this study, I concluded that uh, uh, when we perform the fascicular nerve transfer between the ulnar nerve and the biceps um, um, or brachialis branch of musculocutaneous nerve, we should take a fascicle randomly from the usually from the anteromedial aspect of the ulnar nerve and transfer it to the biceps branch. In my study, I did not find any weakness in the intrinsic muscles and uh, the results were uh, uh, the success was as good as uh, the, when the nerve stimulation was used for the fascicular selection. After that, many articles have been published which support my viewpoint and uh, all of these articles also mention that we should use the ulnar uh, fascicles uh, from the uh, anteromedial aspect and transfer them to biceps branch. Now, one or two transfer, most of the studies, they indicate that uh, if we do the double nerve transfer between the biceps and uh, to the biceps and brachialis branches with ulnar and median nerve uh, as donor nerve, the results are better. These are various studies and uh, all propose that we should do, especially when the C5, C6, C7 injuries are there. In such cases, uh, the this study shows that uh, the double node transfer is better than single node transfer. Coming to the morbidity of bifascicular node transfer, it is more uh, uh, sensory problem rather than motor problem if you use only one or two fascicles and uh, ulnar nerve is more forgiving. Most of the problems are related to the median nerve. Whether we should use ulnar or median, it is not that all the time in partial injury we should uh, just uh, take the ulnar nerve as a motor nerve for the biceps. The decision is made by stimulating the both the nerves, median and the ulnar nerve and whichever is stronger, that should be transferred to the biceps. So in this case, what we find we found was that uh, the median nerve was better responding than the ulnar nerve. So we use the median nerve fascicle for the biceps branch. The other transfer which is used in C5, C6, C7 injuries uh, where the wrist drop is there is the transfer of the distal part of uh, AIN, anterior nerve, which goes to the protocorditus. This uh, patient who had got wrist drop so, in this case, the distal part of anteriorous nerve is divided. This is the protocorditus branch. It is flipped and it is anastomosed with the ECRB branch. 
coming to the next which is is intercostal nerve to muscular cutaneous transfer it is one of the very commonly performed nerve transfer extraplexal nerve transfer in global brachial plexus injuries because we don't have intraplexal donors available in total palsy so usually we use third fourth and fifth intercostal nerves and the recipient nerve muscular cutaneous uh no, because the these uh, intercostal nerves are very thin nerves even nano suture becomes uh, big for these uh, delicate nerves and this becomes more problematic in the when we are dealing with the birth palsies where the nerves are ultra thin so in these cases i use this splint and well technique in cooptation of the intercostal nerve to the muscular cutaneous nerve the three intercostal nerves they are placed parallel on a plastic sheet and then they are glued together with the uh, fibrin glue and thereafter the sutures are passed through the glue and the epineurium of the muscular cutaneous nerve so there is no glue there is no suture directly through the intercostal nerve the suture is through the glue and through the epineurium so direct and uh, the actual neural tissue is not involved in this kind of uh, Uh, in this kind of in this technique of uh, nerve cooptation so three nano sutures between the glue glued intercostal nerves and the muscular cutaneous nerve so in this this is the uh, to, uh, this suture again through the glue and the epineurium of the muscular cutaneous nerve and uh, once we have done that now the nerves are in correct alignment now we do the welding that is we put extra uh, glue over the cooptation side so this is the way this nerve transfer is performed without passing the suture through the actual neural tissue because sutures are prone to uh, develop uh, suture sites uh, the fibrin uh, the the foreign body reaction foreign body granuloma you know uh, apart from damaging the delicate nerve tissue so it this uh, technique takes double advantage of both suturing as well as of glue cooptation sutures are in the extra neural tissue and they minimize the foreign body reaction and splinting of distal segments of intercostal nerves ensures good approximation without loss of axons from the misdirected fascicles the other transfer which is used in total palsy is the contralateral c7 which is usually used as a donor nerve for the median nerve but what i find is that uh, this nerve transfer is uh, is usually uh, it is it it it, it is uh, successful when the patients are younger than 20 years of age and when they are operated early that is within 2 months of injury uh for the elderly patients and those who present late um, generally uh, this transfer is not uh, uh, indicated in my uh, opinion and uh, we hardly find uh, except some return some return of sensations the motor uh, functions are very very minimal so ulnar nerve is taken as a pedicle nerve graft in the conventional kind of contralateral c7 to median nerve and uh, it is this graft is tunnel across the under the chest and is cooptated with the contralateral c7 now contralateral spinal axis you know as a donor for the suprascapular now uh, if you see this patient this patient has got total palsy he has got uh, horner sign positive he has got the trapezius muscle palsy also on the injured side so we don't have any donor no available here yeah, he had phrenic uh, nerve injury also diaphragm was raised so we don't have any donor no available for the suprascapular no so what can be done this uh, this raised diaphragm corner sign positive pseudo meningocells so what was done was that in the prone position the spinal axis now was taken from the contralateral side that is the normal side and it was tunneled under the subcutaneous tissue on the back of the chest and with connected with a nerve graft 
to the suprascapital nerve on the injured side. This is the suprascapital nerve on the injured side. The spinal accessory nerve on the healthy side is divided distally and a nerve graft is used. In this case, the graft length was 13.5 centimeter. The graft is tunneled under the skin and he achieves the around 20-25 degree of active shoulder abduction. So this is the result which he achieved with contralateral spinal accessory nerve to the suprascapular nerve transfer. So this we got published in the Journal of Neurosurgery Spine as use of contralateral spinal accessory nerve for spinal suprascapular neurotization in global brachial plexus injury or new technique. Coming to the another type of injury, C7, C8 and T1 injury. Now classically in these kind of patients, the shoulder abduction and elbow flexions are normal. But patient has got a flail hand, the wrist extension might be present, sensory loss along the ulnar nerve distribution. So in these cases, I prefer triple nerve transfer. The transfer of supinator branches to the post-interosseous nerve. If you see here, the post-interosseous nerve is not responding, but supinator is responding. So, the supinator branches are used, donor now, the two supinator branches for the post interstitial now. And for the finger flexion, the posterior part of median now is neurotized with the brachialis branch. And for sensory innervation, the lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm is transferred to ulnar sensory branch. Coming to the infraclavicular injuries, where usually these patients will have shoulder abduction intact because of the preserved suprascapular nerve, the problem is in the infra, either in the cords, cord level, or in the peripheral nerve branches. Like here, we find a patient who had a uh, musculocutaneous nerve injury, and you can see her neuroma. So one of the and the, the long distal segment of the spinal, uh, the musculocutaneous nerve. Here we find that it is scarred. So one method of reconstruction is either we put a long graph between this to bridge this injured segment. And it is possible that this graft might bypass the biceps muscle. So the other way of handling these kind of injuries is that we use the distal nerve transfer as proposed by Oberlin. And this we also we got published in general of hand surgery, management of isolated musculocutaneous nerve injury, comparing double fascicular nerve transfer with conventional nerve grafting. Now coming to the functional outcomes of various nerve transfers in brachial plexus injury. Here I would like to mention that all these nerve transfer, the timing will depend upon the, the severity of the injury. In partial injuries, really the upper uh, Plexal injury, we can perform the nerve transfer up to 10 months or so because these are intraplexal nerve transfer, very close to the target muscles, and uh, uh, they give early denervation. The nerve transfer will also depend upon the age of the patient. In younger patient, even if the denervation time is of longer duration, it might give results. Coming to the more severe grades of brachial plexus injuries where you use the extra plexal nerve transfer, uh, it is preferred to, it is preferred to uh, perform these transfer before nine months, preferably within three months of injury. C5, C6 injuries. Patient usually have uh, lack of shoulder abduction and elbow flexion, hand function is good with intraplexal donor. These patients achieve good results in shoulder abduction and elbow flexion. Another patient who has also C5, C6 injuries and uh, gets good, uh, by, good strength in biceps and brachialis because of double nerve transfer. 
C5, C6, C7 injuries with the problem not only in the shoulder and elbow, but there is problem in the extension of the wrist and the fingers and here. So in this case, the pronator quadratus branch was transferred to the uh, to the uh, ECRB branch. And this is the wrist extension we can see with this kind of nerve transfer. Other nerve transfer, distal nerve transfer is used for the shoulder and the elbow. 18 months post-op. The patient is uh, well rehabilitated. For the finger extension, later he underwent uh, uh, tendon transfer. Intercostal to muscular cutaneous nerve transfer in birth palsy. Yeah, this you can see the elbow flexion, which is achieved with the intercostal to muscular cutaneous nerve transfer. This uh, coming to the uh, the injury where the uh, the triple nerve transfer has been performed for the hand. This is the pre-operative picture. Elbow uh, shoulder abduction is good. Elbow flexion is bicep strong, but problem is a uh, flail hand. There is no flexion in the fingers and no extension in of the fingers. So results after triple nerve transfer. Supinator to pronator, uh, supinator to post entosis gives good extension of fingers, and this finger flexion he has achieved with brachialis to the post uh, the part of median nerve transfer. Contralateral C7 to median nerve. Results we can expect in younger children, like he is a post traumatic paralysis in a four and a half year old boy with total palsy. No movements at shoulder and elbow. Hand was flail. This is early post op, and this is the result which has been achieved after 14 years in shoulder and elbow for shoulder spinal accessory to suprascapular by posterior approach. For elbow, three intercostal nerves to musculocutaneous nerve, and for the fingers, contralateral C7 to the median nerve. Now, here is a patient who has got total paralysis, a middle aged patient with flail limb. So he undergoes intercostal to muscular cutaneous transfer and the shoulder to and the for the shoulder spinal to suprascapular nerve transfer he recovers shoulder and elbow function but his hand is flail so how i manage this patient so what i use in these cases is i extend the recovered biceps with facial letter tendon to fdp and fpl this is the facial letter which has been tubed and uh, this the proximal part is weaved to the biceps and distal part will be sutured to the flexor tendons FPL and FDP and at the same time the bone grafting is performed uh, wrist arthrosis is done uh, bone blocks are placed between the first and second metacarpals And this kind of results we get with combined muscle uh, nerve transfer and the wrist arthrodesis and facial letter transfer from biceps to flexor tendons. So this is the rehabilitation of a total brachial plexus patient, total BPI injury patient. Thank you so much. This is my team and here I am with my patients. My sincere thanks to Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons who have given me this opportunity to present my work. And uh, I thank all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mandari. This is, was a great presentation <clears throat> as we expected.
with all aspects of the nerve transfers in uh, uh, reconstructing the functional priorities of the, of the brachial plexus. Uh, my short uh, comment, uh, we also use uh, suturing and the gluing technique uh, in um, every anastomosis, uh, in all cases. Uh, usually we put two uh, microsurgical anastomosis and uh, then fibrin glue with, uh, let's say, remodeling of the fibrin glue, amount of the fibrin glue uh, after around the anastomosis, but all other things are, all other things are similar, practically the same. So if I understand that there will be some uh, discussion or question rather from, from the audience or we receive some questions, I don't see nothing in a chat. Not, not anything so far. Thank, thanks for a very good result, uh, Professor. Uh, I, I wanted to ask Professor, uh, in terms of uh, functional recovery, uh, in terms of assessment, how long uh, would be enough for you to decide a way to recover? Because most of the cases, you take years uh, for the patient to recover at least uh, to a certain extent of function. Uh, so how long do we wait uh, for the functional recovery? And uh, another question, Professor, uh, you did show us uh, beside nerve transfer, the other method is to have a nerve and also some bone graft. Uh, so how you decide, uh, how do you do a, 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 when do you need to do a, a, a muscle transfer and when do you need a bone graft? Thank you. Bro. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, your first question is how long sh uh, should we wait? You know, when should we know that we have reached to the finality of the treatment? It will depend upon the type of injury. Generally, what we find is that uh, the recovery is faster and better in partial injury cases. So even then, and the recovery starts coming up after four or five months of uh, nose transfers. And it continues uh, for up to three years. So generally for partial injury, I consider three years is the time when I find that the patient has reached to the, uh, to the uh, results, ultimate results, which is expected to achieve. Now, coming to the uh, total palsy cases, where the results are not uh, satisfactory, very much satisfactory to the clinician and to the patient also. Recovery is very slow. And uh, uh, in such cases, what I find is that we should wait at least for four years uh, uh, to decide about the further uh, reconstruction, if at all he is required. So it is not less than three years in any of the kind of injuries. So this is the first uh, the answer to the answer to your first question. Second is that um, uh, about you asked me where, where we do the bone grafting and where you do the muscle transfer and all. The uh, muscle transfer as a primary procedure has been described by uh, by Doi. Uh, he does it for uh, even uh, fresh cases of uh, total brachial plexus injuries, and uh, he do double nerve transfer. And uh, the, the interval between the two nerve transfer is about two months. But the problem, what I find is that the results which has been achieved by Dewey uh, has not been achieved by the rest of the world. You know? And uh, it requires a lot of uh, supervision of the patients and all. And um, uh, so what I feel in my conditions that uh, if we do the extra plexal nerve transfer, we should be very, very, uh, we, we should be able to motivate the patient to undergo uh, early surgery. That is very important. <coughs> These days, because of the uh, MRI and uh, the electrophysiology, it is possible to convince the patient that uh, you are not going to improve. You have got a very severe kind of injury and uh, you should undergo early surgery. And most of the time, they, they do understand and uh, they go for early surgery. Now, uh, I, uh, once we have restored the uh, shoulder and elbow, which is the uh, prime functions and which are easier to restore than the hand function. Hand function is very difficult to restore. Though Wang has uh, proposed the, uh, the pre-spinal transfer of the contralateral C7 and all, 
but again this has not uh, gained that much of popularity it is very uh, it is uh, uh, the procedure which is not complication free and very extensive procedure required some many times the shortening of the humerus which may not be acceptable to all patients so uh, i try to simplify this procedure by first targeting the shoulder with good uh, donor nose that is spinal accessory in most of the cases phrenic now i regularly reserve i try to use phrenic now mainly on the left side because the what i notice is the morbidity of phrenic now is less on the left side as compared to the right side as because the right uh, lungs they have got three lobes left has got two and right uh, uh, lung has got more uh, to contribute for the uh, lung total vital capacity than the left so in selected cases i when the intercostal nerves are not available because of the fracture ribs or because where the where the intercostal tubes have been placed in such cases i do use phrenic now uh, for the musculocutaneous now so my first aim is to rehabilitate the shoulder and the elbow and if i am uh, if i i get the biceps function then this biceps is used for the rehabilitation of the hand it is extended through the fascia lata and uh, the wrist is arthrodized and uh, bone grafting is done so that the 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 we get a good uh, strength at the uh, at the site of where we have uh, uh, done the plating and at the same time because in this total palsy there the thumb is always in adduction so we to to make it more cosmetic and more a little bit more functional i, I would say rather Uh, we have to do we have to put uh, a bone glab we have to keep the two bones uh, little away so metacarpal between the two metacarpals first and second we put a bone block uh, taken from the iliac crest this is the way i handle these total palsy cases thank you professor thank you thank you thank you very much first of all let me congratulate professor bandari for the, such a wonderful demonstration of procedures and we are extremely grateful to you to you that you came here and shared your views with us may i go back to our chair professor lucas raslis to hear his concluding remarks after which yes. we move on yes uh, this is a uh, was a um, exciting uh, talk uh, which uh, i believe that uh, will uh, contribute to the understanding of the importance of uh, knowledge of the intraneural uh anatomy and topography and systematization in terms of um uh, uh reconstructive surgery rest restoration of the functional priorities of the brachial plexus in a best possible way to contribute the understanding of the selection of the best possible donors for this uh, uh renovation uh, activities uh, and uh, finally this is something which uh, i believe uh, will increase uh, interest uh, for uh, peripheral neurosurgery within the young neurosurgeons because this is a very rewarding surgery and uh, you can expect uh, very good results if you uh, perform all this uh, in a proper manner in a proper timing and uh, uh, you will significantly contribute to the quality of life of the patients Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Aslich. Uh, if I may inform our viewers that this has been broadcast on WeChat, YouTube, and Zoom, and thanks to Professor Shubin, we have uh, around 530 people who are watching us live as of now on all the different channels. So we are extremely grateful to everybody who joined. We move on to the second session, and I will hand this podium over to our very honourable faculty from Japan, Professor Naoki Otani. who will say a short introduction and invite professor hu peng for his lecture professor otani thank you, thank you dr raja yeah, so, so second topic is about the uh, epidural uh, pretemporal transcavernous approach for intracranial vascular disease so uh, i think this approach is firstly described by uh, professor christ uh, anka arkansas in the us right Yeah. For these aneurysms, uh, there seems to be the, uh, several approaches, such as uh, extradural temporal approach or the 
uh, anterior te temporal approach. And uh, so in particular, the epidural pretemporal transcapinous approach. So re recently, Professor Hupen has, uh, you published on the uh, operative neurosurgery about this approach, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am very looking forward to uh, talk, uh, taking uh, your lecture today. So yes, thank you so much. There may be several surgical tip tips to avoid uh, com several complications uh, related to this approach, such as uh, uh, spinoparietal sinus injury or the cranial nerve injury, in particular the oculomotor nerve injury. And uh, so uh, hemostasis of the venous bleeding from the uh, lateral uh, cabinet sinus. So, uh, so I, I would like to uh, so get uh, any knowledge about this approach uh, from you, you, you are, uh, through your uh, presentation. So Professor Hupen, uh, so let's get started, please. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. You're very nice. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Botani. Um, I believe you have uh, did a lot of uh, work uh, in this topic. Um, today, I'm uh, going to talk about my little uh, experience about the epidural pretemporal transcommonous approach uh, to treat uh, the uh, vascular disease around the, the, the uh, score base. Uh, my name is Wu Peng from uh, uh, Xiong Hospital, Capital Medical University. Um, uh, this approach is, uh, I think, is of a course and uh, could be uh, utilized uh, not only for the intracranial vascular disease, but also the, for the uh, cranial-based tumors, like they are uh, clotted ophthalmic segment aneurysms, and uh, also we can approach the uh, upper basilar system. Um, if we go a little bit anteriorly, uh, we could also um, do the um, uh, orbit apex surgeries. Of course, uh, this is a quite uh, classical uh, surgery um, using this approach to treat the common sinus fistula. And, um, as uh, Professor Otani just uh, mentioned, I published a paper uh, to do the uh, STA PCA SA bypass using this approach to treat a very uh, rare disease, uh, this anterior spinal artery aneurysm, of course, the cranial based tumors. Um, this approach was uh, initially uh, established by uh, Professor Dolins. Uh, up to 30 years ago to treat the neutral vascular relations. And later was used to uh, treat the clotted uh, ophthalmic artery aneurysms. And then uh, go to the upper basilar system aneurysms. And later, um, the, uh, Professor Ali Christ uh, has published uh, several uh, papers to uh, very detailed uh, demonstrate this approach uh, to treat the very complex aneurysms. I have been learning from uh, um, these masters uh, as well as uh, Dr. Sanford uh, to uh, learning this uh, complex approach uh, to treat some uh, diseases. Now, uh, next, I would like to uh, introduce my experience to treat uh, um, this disease. Uh, the first patient uh, is uh, unruptured left uh, uh, of ophthalmic segment aneurysm. The patient has uh, visual problems. And uh, I used the, the uh, Epidural protemporal transcommonous approach after the uh, um, traditional frontal temporal craniotomy, I removed the lateral and upper wall of the orbit and then dissect the lateral wall of the corner sinus to fully expose the anterior cranial process and then unroof the 
uh, of uh, the, the the optic canal, and then remove the anterior cranial process and to drill uh, drill uh, the uh, residual uh, optic extract and then open the dura using a uh, classic called Donis fashion. By using this method, we can um, we can actually combine the epidural and the subdural space, and then dissect the distal dural ring and open the crowded cola to expose the clinal segment of the crowded artery. And it is very important to circumferentially um, dissect the distal uh, dural ring to uh, free the crowded artery. And then I uh, do the pilot clipping. And we need to uh, adjust the um, clips several times to fully close the aneurysm and uh, at the same time uh, preserve the normal lumen of the crowded artery. And here we can see the proximal uh, aneurysm neck. And we could uh, close this neck under the direct uh, visualization. And finally, to close the distal aneurysm neck, and then finally uh, open the aneurysm sac to check the uh, uh, promise aneurysm clipping. Finally, we use some muscle pieces to reconstruct the, uh, reconstruct the uh, score base and suture the dura. Um, immediately after the operation, we can see that uh, uh, the aneurysm has been fully, um, has been fully uh, closed and uh, the uh, crowded artery has been preserved very well. And six months later, we get this control angiography, we can see that the aneurysm was very nicely closed and the patient recovered very well. Another case is a little bit complex, um, uh, more than the first case. This is a ruptured uh, giant aneurysm. And uh, we can see that the, the crawling artery has a stenosis uh, distal to the aneurysm. We are not sure this is a this is a, a actual stenosis or was compressed by the aneurysm. So uh, we did um, we did the uh, protective uh, SGA bypass uh, MC bypass. Uh, we uh, dissect the uh, SGA from the spinous foramen. And we open the dura. That's it, the cell fissure. Evacuate the clot. Here we can see the M3 of the uh, middle cerebral artery. I approached. Uh, I approached this uh, proximally uh, to uh, investigate the crowded artery. It seems like a little bit yellow, um, but not very sure because I didn't get the proximal control. I don't want to uh, deal with the annual mistake. So I uh, did the uh, did bypass first. Double burial STMC bypass was uh, performed. 
So after the first anastomosis and uh, the second ICG angiography indicated um, pregnancy of the bypass. And then I uh, performed the uh, epidural approach to uh, expose the donor's triangle. The bleeding from the coronal sinus could be um, stopped by packing some uh, pieces of a surgery cell. And you can see on roof the optic canal and remove the anterior cranial process and then open the carotid cola to get the proximal control of the carotid artery. Then I'm going to explore the aneurysm. I open the optic sheath and then circumferentially um, dissect the distal urine and the, then proximal control, distal control, and punct uh, puncture the aneurysm to uh, release the and then try to, con to clip the aneurysm. For this uh, very complex aneurysm, we always need to adjust, uh, adjust uh, the uh, clips uh, several times to get a good re reconstruction. And uh, after the clipping, we perform the RCG angiography, we can see then the palisade of the carotid artery as well as the bypass. Yes. And finally, I um, open the aneurysm is the final view of the operation. Immediately after the operation, the patient uh, stayed in the ICU for uh, several days and then was discharged for uh, further rehabilitation. The CT scan and uh, the CTA reviewed uh, good results and also the MRI, we didn't see any um, ischemia events. Um, after rehabilitation, she recovered from uh, this attack and uh, now lived a normal, normal life. Uh, this is a little different uh, circumstances. We can see this uh, is a small breast OA aneurysm and it was previously uh, coiled uh, in other hospital. But after the embolization, the patient had uh, the vision uh, deterioration. So mm -hmm. the patient uh, referred to our um, institute for further treatment. And from this view, we can see that the, um, previously the aneurysm was very nicely uh, packed with coils. Um, but uh, the rechecked angiography, you can see uh, that the re canalization of the aneurysm leg and the patient has um, deterioration of, the, uh, of his vision. So uh, we uh, performed the aneurysm uh, clip and uh, uh, we evacuated the smombros and the coils from the sac. And the patient uh, get a very good recover from uh, this surgery. Another different case is uh, a little distal a little uh, bit, a little distal aneurysm, uh, this pecan aneurysm. This is a old lady has uh, some uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, the patient uh, uh, was transferred to our hospital for um, for the treatment. Uh, because uh, the 
the patient has a very uh, has a severe stenosis, just the proximal the aneurysm. So uh, it was considered very dangerous to do the uh, to the uh, do the uh, embolization. Um, what I did is uh, was uh, I um, firstly do the protective bypass. Uh, by using uh, the SCA. I learned this uh, uh, SCA dissection techniques from Dr. Tanikawa. It's very uh, efficient and uh, also clean. And this is the frontal branch of the SCA. I open the dural, we can see that uh, the um, the superficial cell wing vein was uh, adhered uh, to the dural very tight. So I need to release this uh, adhesion first for the further cell wing fissure dissection. Actually, this uh, this vein uh, drains to the common sinus. The sumi fissure was fully dissect, uh, dissected, and uh, we can see this uh, optic nerve. And we did the uh, use the bypass. We use the ultrasound to uh, check the pedicin or the bypass. Another graft was sutured to the middle cerebral artery. And then we did, uh, I did, uh, because the because I uh, explored the carotid artery initially, um, and I see that it is a real stenosis, and uh, the carotid artery was very hard to uh, get a uh, proximal control. And uh, also, uh, the aneurysm was uh, almost uh, behind the carotid artery. We can hardly uh, see the aneurysm. So uh, I can imagine the uh, difficult situation we when dealing with aneurysm, so I need to uh, get a proximal control. So I uh, did the uh, epidural approach to expose the proximal carotid uh, artery. This is a kind of segment of the uh, internal carotid artery. Fortunately, uh, this segment of the carotid artery uh, is not uh, is not very bad, and uh, I can get a promise control of this uh, internal carotid artery. So 
I uh, I can uh, deal with deal with the uh, aneurysm. I release the distorted ordering and uh, fully uh, free the the internal coordinate and then uh, proximal control. This is the hypoplastic of the AC, and uh, I. I uh, just uh, disconnected this artery uh, after the perforators, and uh, in this way, I can um, I can move the uh, internal carotid artery and uh, to uh, to see the aneurysm. This is the um, posterior communicating artery. Also, uh, temporarily clipped. It was very, very difficult and dangerous to uh, direct, directly uh, clip this engine. After several attempts, I I give up the directly clipping this engine. Uh, Instead, I use the wrapping clipping technique. I put a piece of uh, hot noise. And then clip, wrapping and clipping the aneurysm like this way. Finally, the uh, internal cordial artery as well as the middle stable artery was proved uh, to be patent. I also used uh, this mirror to check the uh, falling wrapping of the aneurysm and the third ventricle. This is the final view of the operation. And after the operation, the patient did well. And uh, they rechecked the angiography. You can see this is the external carotid artery injection. We can see this uh, um, a very good pattern of the uh, double barrier bypass. And the aneurysm was wrapped. And the patient has been followed for three years, and she lived a normal life. And uh, we can also approach uh, to the posterior circulation uh, for the upper basal, basal system, uh, like uh, Dr. Uh, Dolins and, uh, and Ali Krishna has, been, uh, has demonstrated. Uh, this uh, large uh, basal tip aneurysm, we uh, use this approach uh, to get the exposure. You can see we uh, use the exposure around the oculomotor nerve and uh, we can put the uh, temporary clips through the lateral space of the oculomotor nerve and then re uh, reconstruct the uh, basal apex. And after the operation, the rechecking uh, angiography, you can see that the aneurysm was nicely uh, closed. Another case is the uh, um, upper basal trunk aneurysm. Uh, this aneurysm was very dangerous to. Uh, to be analyzed, so uh, we performed the uh, uh, aneurysm trapping and uh, high flow bypass. 
this is the, uh, some pictures from the operation. And this is the uh, uh, neck exposure and uh, the uh, epidural exposure. And then we do the bypass. And this is the uh, intracranial anastomosis and the neck anastomosis. And uh, then we uh, trapped the aneurysm. The um, uh, RCG graphy indicated uh, patency of the bypass. But unfortunately, after the surgery, um, the patient uh, has uh, the uh, uh, they are pons infection because the uh, the perforators coming from the angular sac, and uh, the rechecked uh, CT we can see a very good uh, trapping of the aneurysm and bypass, and after rehabilitation the patient um, lived a life with MRI is uh, three. This is another case uh, I published uh, on the operative a new surgery. This is a um, somewhat hemorrhage uh, patient, uh, which was uh, uh, resulted from the rupture of the anterior spinal artery aneurysm. Because this patient has uh, bilateral occlusive uh, vertebral artery disease, the right side is falling occlusion, and the left side we can see this uh, severe stenosis uh, between the vertebral artery and the basal artery. And the, the uh, anterior spinal artery can uh, compensate the, the uh, blood flow to the distal basal system. This is a flow uh, related uh, aneurysm. It is very difficult to directly clip or embolize this aneurysm um, because this aneurysm was resulted from the uh, high blood flow uh, within the little uh, artery. So if we can uh, if we can improve the distal blood flow, maybe the aneurysm could be uh, could be uh, uh, could be uh, healed it itself. Uh, the patient has a poor um, compensating blood flow from the anterior uh, circulation. Uh, this is the video of this operation. I also initially we I um, <coughs> dissect the. They are both branches of the superficial temporal artery. And this is the frontal branch of the SGA. And uh, then I, uh, then the middle cranial base was flushed, and the middle uh, mitral artery was uh, disconnected from the uh, from the sphenous foramen, just the anterior of the spinal uh, sphenous foramen is the foramen ovale. And then I remove the superior and lateral of the orbit to expose the superior orbital fissure. And then I peel off the outer layer of the lateral of the corner sinus. This is the foramen rotundum and V2. Uh, And after this dissection, we can fully expose the cranial nerves of the lateral wall. And then I uh, remove the ACP and also unroof the optic nerve. And then I move to the subdural space.
I opened the URL along the uh, tutorial edge, and uh, here I dissected the um, cranial node 4 and the cranial node 3, and then removed some, uh, some dura of the um, tutorial. So I extend the walking space because I need to I expose the uh, P2A. So I dissected this only figure to get an um, uh, upper, upper view. And this stage, you can see the P2A and the ISA. And also can see the perforators going to the mid brain. This is a little bit larger Mm, frontal branch. I suture this branch to the PCA. Although the PCA has been uh, trapped, the perforator still um, has some blood flow going out. And then I suture the frontal branch to the PCA. I should use, use this in uh, interrupted, interrupted uh, stitches. Finishing the first uh, anastomosis, ACG angiography indicated uh, patency of the bypass. And similarly, I uh, did the second anastomosis. And finally, you can see these uh, two, bypa two, two bypasses. This is the final view of the operation. And I close the dura water tightly by stitches and also glue. Uh, post the operation, the patient has uh, a transient uh, cranial nose 3 a palsy. And uh, this is the control angiography immediately after the operation. You can see that the patency of the bypass and the upper the basic system was fully um, faded by the STA. And the patient has some ischemia event. And then five, five months after the operation, the patient uh, was followed and uh, he has fully recovered from the cranial nose 3 palsy. And the control angiography, you can see that uh, the uh, frontal branch was uh, the, uh, the, the frontal branch anastomosis to the PCA was uh, patent, uh, but the other branch was closed itself. Um, this STA uh, fully fit the visceral system. And the left vertebral vertebra after injection, you can see then the aneurysm uh, has fully uh, regressed itself. Um, also, we can use this approach to uh, do the uh, counter sinus uh, fistula. Uh, this uh, old lady has uh, this uh, red eye, and uh, you can see that the endography indicated um, uh, artery uh, 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 
the dura uh, dura corner sinus fistula and uh, was faded by the uh, uh, by the right internal carotid artery and this is the AP view and the lateral view and you can see that uh, the, fist the fistula was drained uh, um, anteriorly and this patient was uh, initially tried to uh, to be uh, to be uh, dealt with through the interventional uh, approach, but uh, has failed. So I did the uh, microsurgery for this patient, also using the epidural or protemporal approach. And this is after dissection of the uh, uh, lateral wall of the corner sinus. And they inserted the third uh, cell uh, through the Dolin's triangle to the uh, superior, uh, superior compartment of the corner sinus, where the fistula mainly drainaged. And then Im immediately after the operation, you can see then the uh, drainage to the ophthalmic vein uh, was uh, closed. And uh, uh, this is a one-year follow-up. You can see that the patient uh, fully recovered. Um, sometimes we can, uh, using this approach, go a little bit anterior to the orbit apex, like this patient. Uh, this patient has a corner sinus, uh, has a, sorry, has a orbit apex uh, corner malformation. And uh, I use this approach uh, to open the orbital apex and uh, then remove this lesion. And uh, immediately after the operation, the patient uh, recovered uh, rapidly from her uh, viral loss. And uh, this is a six months control MRI. You can see that the lesion has no uh, evidence of uh, 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 regrowth. Mm. I would like, I would like to uh, sum this approach. Is um, uh, this is a very uh, this is a great approach and it can access a, a variety every uh, area around the paracellular space. And uh, but the, if you want to do uh, this surgery, you need to um, have a profound understanding of the anatomy. Of course, you can um, you can uh, read this book, uh, and we also need to practice a lot in the anatomy in lab, and also investigate the master's operation. Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to give my uh, thanks to. Uh, Professor Yoko Kato, Professor Xu Bing, and also Professor uh, Raja, uh, and uh, as well as the um, Asian con uh, Asian uh, Congress of uh, Neurological uh, uh, Asian Congress of Neuro uh, Neurological uh, 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 Surgery. Thank you very much for your long time uh, efforts to promote our uh, uh, us going uh, to, uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much to uh, Professor Yubin. So uh, to present your excellent surgical techniques and uh, to show the surgical tips on these approaches. So any question and comment from the audience? Uh, so far, none. None. So none. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so, may I ask a question from me? Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you can, uh, so, uh, uh, proximal, proximal, uh, so, so, C3 portion, C3 portion yeah. of the cavities. Yeah. So, you, you uh, get, uh, uh, so, space to, uh, clip the uh, C3 portion, but yeah. I I uh, I prefer to uh, keep the uh, carotid 
カロティッド、サービカルカロティッドアートリーです。So, uh, don't you use、uh, so, suction decompression、uh, so, to, so, for the large, large ophthalmic aneurysms? So, because、uh, so, several times we can, so, so you, you just uh, so, uh, uh,、um, A、puncture, punctures、uh, aneurysm domes. Yeah. To, yeah. To, yes. But uh, so it's, it's, if you just puncture the aneurysm domes, so it's a one chance to clip the.、Uh, you, you understand? Can you? Can you yeah, right. Right.、So、yeah. But, yeah. Yes, but uh, suction, uh, for, uh, so for the suction decompression, we can、yes. try to. Several times to.、Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so don't, yeah. Don't you use the suction decompression for the、uh, ophthalmic、uh, aneurysms? Yes, I,、mm, I used ones.、Uh, I, I would like to say that、uh, the, the um, uh, suction decompression technique、uh, is, a, is a very、um, good choice and it also is a great option. And there、uh, was a.、Um, I, I, I used once、uh, for a patient, is,、uh, the patient is a giant、uh, quality of some segment aneurysm. Uh, uh-huh. And uh, the, the aneurysm, uh, uh, the aneurysm uh, uh, group uh, arise from the、uh, of some segment, but also、uh, attacked the、uh, clinal segment. But I didn't uh, uh, actually uh, clearly. See these、uh, circumstances before the operation. So、uh, during the operation, when I、uh, when I did the、uh, epidural、uh, work, the aneurysm ruptured. But f- fortunately, this aneurysm, the blood just going to the、uh, epidural space, not the subdural space.、Mm-hmm. I so um,、uh, I I also opened the neck uh, before uh, before the craniotomy, so I have the chance to do the、uh, suction decompression. I fully agree with your、uh, suggestions. Sometimes, yes, actually,、um, if we pun- if、uh, we puncture the aneurysm, we yes, we we, we may we may have uh, some uh, some mess during the operation because if we ca- cannot uh, um, uh, uh, clip the aneurysm very well, the,、uh, the 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 blood will uh, uh, would uh, go out and、uh, the operative field is、uh, is not clean. And it's difficult to say. So I fully agree with you that、um, if、um, so, we need to、uh, we need to firstly、um, uh, investigate the、uh, aneurysm neck and、uh, also the carotid artery and uh, to uh, ask ask ourselves ourselves、uh, uh, do we have uh, 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 confidence to to uh, to uh, clip the aneurysm uh, uh, very well. If、uh, we have some difficulties, if I have some difficulties, maybe、uh, I need I would uh, uh, open the neck and、uh, prepare to do the suction de- decompression.、Yeah. If I have the confidence to uh, to uh, uh, good you know, good reconstruct the、uh, carotid artery and clip the aneurysm, so、uh, maybe I. I would uh, just uh, uh, trap the aneurysm and puncture the aneurysm and then、mm-hmm. do as I plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. So, and、uh, one more question. So,、yeah. uh, would you would you use uh, uh, so uh, visually evoked potential? Do you monitor? Yeah. Do you have yeah. the operation?、Uh, yes.、Uh-huh. Yes, we always use this. In my in my personal ex,、uh, experience,、mm-hmm. I, uh, so about twenty or twenty five percent. So、uh, we so visual visual、uh, so field uh, deficit uh, we can detect the uh, so up、uh, and so ipsi ipsilateral、uh, quad quadral um, quadral geminal、uh, so hemianopia. We we、uh, often experienced、uh, so after the operation, so I think it might be the,、uh, caused by the heat injury of the drilling of the 
uh, you, you use uh, uh, so drilling of the optic channel opening. So, but I usually use, uh, just only use uh, uh, micro punch, no, no drilling, no drilling technique. I, I, I will recommend uh, so no drilling technique for the uh, so optic channel opening. So do, uh, you you use uh, uh, drilling of the uh, so in your slide in your uh, so in your slide uh, you use uh, uh, so. Yes, he is using drilling. 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 Yeah, drilling. Rupang, you drill the uh, optic canal, isn't it? Yeah, so have drilling. you yeah. have you found visual decline in any of your patients? No, never. No. Yeah, never. Yeah, no. never. Yeah, never. Oh. Mm. Okay. Yes, I when know, when I did the um, optic canal drilling, I. Uh, always use the uh, continuous cold water irrigation. Yeah. This is very important to prevent the uh, healing uh, injury to the optic nerve. Mm -hmm. And also we, we, we cannot use, um, use uh, much attention to compress out, uh, the, 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 the optic roof. And uh, uh, how, how do you use uh, uh, do, so primary watertight closure? Can you can you watertight closure? Uh, yes. Uh, sometimes we we can uh, we 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 suture the dura and then use the muscle pieces and then the fibrous glue to reconstruct the cranial base and also the uh, the, the, the dura. Uh, okay, spinal drainage or what? No. No. Spinal drainage. No. No. Yeah. Yes, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Hu Peng and Professor Naokyo Tani for this wonderful. If I may ask Professor Hu Peng one question, like uh, what are your tips for opening the porous trochlearis and the porous oculomotor nerve? Um, yes, if I if I need to, it just uh, I, I just uh, uh, did this uh, procedure like uh, Ali Krish. I actually I have been learning. Um, uh, for, long, for a long time from uh, the Ali Krish, but I didn't actually um, have the chance to go to the uh, USA. I, 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 I think then if I, want, if I need to use the uh, lateral space of the cranial nose 3, I need to free and prolong the cranial nose 3 to release the tension. Because uh, when I use this window, I need to, um, I need to move the the cranial nose three to get a larger exposure. So in this uh, situation, I need to uh, release the cranial nose three and uh, open the ocular motor porous. Uh, just uh, um, very carefully on the big uh, on the big uh, magnification and uh, uh, open the the the, the common sinus roof. Uh, little by little to see the cranial three, and then we can see the uh, the, the cranial three uh, within the porous and also the, the sub sub arachnoid space, and then open it uh, little by little. And uh, sometimes I, I I never use the coagulation if uh, bleeding coming from the dura. I just uh, use the surgery cell. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, we can uh, conclude the session by hearing the final remarks from Professor Otani. So, as the professor Thanks. suggested, um, uh, it will be useful and uh, it can be weapon uh, to to familiar with uh, this extradural approach to so paracrinoid regions. So, uh, my boss, uh, the, so. Professor Yonekawa in the Zurich University Hospital. So usually told me, so you you have to uh, get the technique or the extradural approach because it's uh, very useful for the uh, paracrinoid tumor or the paracrinoid aneurysms or the uh, so uh, vaginal distal vaginal aneurysms uh, because 
to get the wider uh, optical carotid space and the retro carotid space. So it's uh, to, to accomplish uh, uh, surgical, uh, uh, surgical exposure so to, to uh, save and uh, uh, accomplish uh, so uh, complete uh, surgical uh, strategies. So, um, so uh, in, in, in Zurich University, so they usually use the selective extradural uh, craniodectomy. It's uh, so called SEAC. Uh, selective extra dural craniodectomy. It's not, uh, we, I cannot uh, use the SEAC because of the, so no, no good orientation. So, but uh, I think that so to confirm the uh, entirely the anterior cranial process, uh, we have to, uh, so uh, we have to peeling of the lateral capinous sinus and uh, uh, so extra durally uh, to uh, expose the uh, entirely uh, the anterior cranial process is needed. So uh, I I just uh, learned uh, from the uh, your uh, doctor professor Hugh Penn uh, through the your good uh, the presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we learned a lot today from Professor Hoopeng's lecture. So now it's time that uh, I'll wind this up officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Premis Bandari and Professor Hoopeng, as well as the chairs, Professor Lucas Raslich and Professor Naoki Otani for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would like to also express my sincere gratitude to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel, and as of uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, we have around 530 people who have joined online on various streaming platforms. A big special thanks to my co-host Liu Bun Seng for joining me today. So until we all meet online tomorrow, it is bye bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining. <laughs>